Thank you very much for this introduction, which I hope was very kind and very positive. Well, I didn't understand one word of it, so I hope it was positive. Uh, was it positive? Yes. yes. Okay. Very positive. <laughs> okay. Uh, dear rector, dear deans, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was asked to present the way in which we organize in our faculty research, our faculty being part of the University of Leuven. Just to uh, situate our faculty, our faculty uh, has a long history. It was founded in 1432, um, seven years after the university was erected, for in the Middle Ages you could only become a university when you had a faculty of theology, and you had to wait for a couple of years in order to prove that you could survive and thus were able to found a faculty of theology. Uh, we had some great names here, the Pope Adrian, uh, who was the first and the last, the first and the last Dutch man who became Pope. Uh, Latomus, who was described by Luther as his most clever opponent. Bias, who made us uh, very famous because he was twice condemned by Rome. Cornelius Jansenius of Ghent was uh, an important figure because he reno uh, renovated uh, exegesis in the uh, 16th century. And Cornelius Jansenius of Wipers, uh, again a Dutchman, was uh, condemned in 1641, three years after his death. So he himself has never known that people had condemned him which is an advantage, as you can imagine. Um, then, uh, because of the French Revolution, the university and the faculty were both closed. We started again in 1834 as a reaction against the Free University of Brussels, the Free Masons University. And we had, again, people we are still proud of. Uh, Van Oornacker, who was probably the most important uh, Old Testament exegete of the beginning of the 20th century, was one of the few who escaped a condemnation because of modernism. Paulin Landeuze was our rector from uh, 1909 to 1940. As you see, rector, there's still, uh, there's, a, there's still a future for you. You can continue for 31 years when you come to Leuven. And then Gerard Philips, who indeed was uh, one of the most important drafters of Lumen Gentium at the Second Vatican Council. Uh, Vatican II is for us the most inspiring event of the 20th century. Uh, the title is not uh, invented in Leuven, but was a title uh, invented by a Spanish scholar who was of the opinion that everything that went wrong in the church in the 70s was the fault of Leuven. That's the reason why he speaks of Lovanium Primum. Uh, in 1968, uh, we had the, the split of the two universities, the French-speaking university and the Dutch-speaking university. And so we started with an autonomous Flemish university and there's also a Flemish faculty of theology. And the challenge at that moment was for the theologian, what, do we want to be a local, a provincial faculty, or do we want to internationalize? Indeed, in 68, French was the international theological language, not English. So, for the Flemish-speaking people, publishing in French was in fact confirming again that the French language was superior to the Dutch language. So, that was a great challenge. As a result, as a, result a new faculty was founded for a new period, and we started at that moment with international programs in English. The first year we had in the international programs in English 77 students, and most of them, if not all, came from the American college, which at that time was still in Leuven. And the amazing thing is that the American college was before the split part of the French-speaking department of our faculty, but they were very happy to give up French which for them was a very difficult language, and thus to use their own mother tongue, being English. So as you can see, 
every disadvantage has an advantage for both the Americans and for our faculty. What was also interesting in 68 was that because uh, more than half of the professors left Leuven, because they were French-speaking professors, uh, the faculty had to hire people belonging to, regular, to the regular clergy. For instance, Jesuits, Oblates, and they had already, these people had already an international reputation, and so from the one day to the other, we lost very good people, but at the same time, we got a new generation of really promising scholars. In the 70s, there was a crisis in the Low Countries, uh, a crisis uh, because of uh, many reasons, uh, of, among others, because quite a good number of people left the priesthood, and so we had to look for new people, and that were then lay theologians. We had to wait till 1985, we are not proud of that, but we had, had to wait till 1985 before we had the first female professor. We were already very near to the third millennium but before we had the first uh, lay dean, and today 80% uh, of the staff are lay people. And I will show you later why this was important and why it impacted our way of doing research. Today our faculty is, I think, is an internationally oriented faculty. As you can see, we hire professors from the Netherlands. Well, because they speak Dutch, maybe, but also because of their reputation. But also from the USA, from Canada. There's still a discussion whether people in Canada speak English, yes or no, but that's uh, something we can discuss later, for instance, during lunch. Um, then from the United Kingdom, from Germany, from India, uh, sorry, see, twice Germany, so I missed something, and over this year, somebody from Austria. That means that you have an, an, another composition in your faculty with people who have other expectations, who belong to other university traditions, and thus, that is a challenge to keep them whole together. I had the pleasure to try to do that for about 12 years as the dean of this faculty. The education in our faculty is no longer in a homogeneous uh, Dutch setting, but because of the Dutch and English ed educational programs, it is a, a program in which we are obliged, challenged, urged to dialogue with students and professors coming from different backgrounds. And we have students uh, coming from about 70, 70 different nationalities, not 17, but 70. So you can immediately see the challenge we are confronted with. You are, of course, interested in the number of students. As you can see, uh, we ha are have, uh, at the end of 2018, we had about 735 students, uh, 15 students. Uh, for this year, it is a bit bit higher, we are now uh, going back in the direction of 800 students. And you can also see that uh, uh, in our faculty, the majority of the students are still men, but uh, women are coming nearer and nearer. And so I presume that in 2450, it will be 50% men and 50% women. The English speaking uh, students uh, especially those of the start, are a real challenge for us because these students come to Leuven for two reasons. They come for the master program and they want to obtain a doctoral degree in order to go back to the south and to serve their uh, communities either as uh, professors and then later on as bishops. In the last years, since 2013, maybe that's a surprise, but since 2013, with the coming of Pope Francis, we see that more and more Louvain alumni are appointed as bishops or auxiliary bishops, as happened in the beginning of this week, with one auxiliary bishop in India. The students are coming from more than 70 countries. The group of female theologians is growing, which has an impact, whether you like it or not, which has an impact on doing theology and doing religious studies. A theological faculty like ours is an integral part of a comprehensive university. 
That means that we have no privileges. That is the main difference between our faculty and, for instance, the Faculty of Theology in Louvain-en-Oeuvre. In Louvain-en-Oeuvre, there is an agreement between the faculty and the university that they get 15 positions for professors. We have to work for every position. That also means that we don't get a, a normal budget, let us say, every year the rector decides to give us let us say, one million euro, it doesn't work like that. We have to work on that day after day, night after night, week after week, weekend after weekend. So that is the challenge for us. We, have, we benefit from the fact that we are part of a comprehensive university. We are respected for that, but at the same time, we have to behave like all other faculties. That, of course, has an impact on our research. The reason why I was invited was to present the research in our faculty here for this audience. In 2015, we created the research master. That is a master of two years, and this is intended to increase the quality of the research also of our students. Students after two years of the research master should be ready and well prepared to obtain a doctoral degree in a period of four years. So most of the students are six years with us, most of the students coming from abroad are six years with us, two years as master in the research master and four years uh, in the doctoral program. A doctoral school means that you need uh, money. If you don't have money, then you can't do research. That is, uh, as they say in Dutch, and waarheid als een koe, that is something which is quite normal. If you don't have money, you, don't do, you can't do research. 50% of the research means come from external sponsors and European money. For instance, Horizon 2020, we are benefiting from that in our faculty. And also, we have our first ERC grant, uh, which will start in September 2019. That means that 50%, can you imagine? 50% of our money comes from outside the university and comes from European money. This is uh, our doctoral school. Uh, because of, because of the, the REMA, the research master, you see that it has an impact on our numbers. The selection becomes more and more severe, more and more tough, and I expect that it will go a bit down, but the advantage is that you no longer are giving a doctoral degrees, uh, uh, if I may say so, ante previsa merita, that you give your doctoral degrees on the basis of quality and not on the basis of uh, other arguments which I don't like. <coughs> and that is uh, what we have done. Uh, since 2012, as you can see, the numbers are more or less stable. Sometimes it is because somebody started with a project financed by the FWO, that you have sometimes more, sometimes less candidates. But we still have every year over 20 doctoral uh, dissertations presented and defended at our faculty. So the admission procedure has become more and more severe. Every year we allow in our research master about 60 students and we have more than 250 applications. So that means that 190 students are not accepted in the program. Uh, the fact that we have uh, our faculty of theology and religious studies means that we also have to strengthen our interdisciplinary approach and that will thus also result in new profiles. For instance, we now have a young uh, professor of psychology of religion who is not belonging to our faculty but who is in the faculty of psychology. Then, uh, what about our projects? We obtained over the last five years, six years, uh, 62 projects, and that is for a budget of about uh, 18 million euro. So that is what we have to, that, that, no, that explains my gray hair, yeah? Uh, we have to uh, find our money in the, fa uh, in the university, that is uh, the both that are research professors, then in the FWO, that is uh, with the National Fund for Research, where we are quite successful, I think. Then, so now and then, 
I will come back to that later. So now and then we have to uh, buy new machinery and then we go to a special program in Belgium, Hercules, where uh, every year a universe, the, the, fa uh, the humanities uh, can obtain one or two projects and now we, we, had, we obtained one already and now this year another one was approved. So if I come back next year and offer you the, uh, the numbers here, then you will see that it's not longer one, but two. And then of course we have uh, uh, one EU in, the, in that period, but we obtained one uh, last year and you will see that that really increases our income. But it just it gives you an idea that we ha really have to work in order to obtain our money. Indeed, in the Horizon 2020, and maybe you have read it somewhere in the Horizon 2020 program, uh, we got uh, together with uh, 11 other partners, we got an ARIRES program that is religion, infrastructure, research uh, in religious studies. Um, that is a program in which we bring together uh, partners. Uh, we in Leuven, we, have, we, get, we get about 1,100,000 euro. We have the opportunity to bring together young scholars from everywhere. Um, in Europe, we also uh, train youngsters. Uh, we uh, meet each other on a regular basis and it is really a program in which we hope that we will be able to bring together several uh, databases so that you can through one, uh, entra uh, one entrance, you can use also the databases of other institutions. This is really a great opportunity, I think, for young scholars who want to do short-term research. And what is interesting that is that they come for a specific uh, research question, but soon they will discover that in a university like that in Leuven, that there is not only an answer to the question they have, but also that they discover that there are other opportunities, other databases, other archives, other precious books they can cons consult, which is indeed a great opportunity for youngsters. And the interesting thing, for those of you who might be interested in applying for it, the interesting thing is that everything is paid. Uh, what is for the doctoral candidates, the travel costs are covered, and you uh, receive a per diem, of about 80 euros a day, so that while you are in Leuven, you don't have to pay uh, from your own pocket. Also, the, uh, the housing is preserved in the project. I think that for young people, this is, and even for less young people, this is a great opportunity. Then, uh, because of the fact that there are so many developments in theology and religious studies, uh, I decided in 2003 he is the oldest one, uh, to, to create, to create uh, special chairs. And these special chairs are uh, externally financed. That means that you look for sponsors, for people who are uh, willing to invest their money in youngsters. As you can see, Noe is a bit less young, but in uh, 2003 he was really a youngster, right? Yeah, as you know, we all uh, will change throughout our lives, but uh, he's still looking well. Uh, so he was hired because he had an expertise in pastoral theology and men mentally handicapped people. He had an expertise in medieval uh, Dutch spirituality. He is an expert in Benedictine uh, monasticism. He comes from Intems and he has done a lot of work on uh, marriage. He is an expert in uh, religion, peace and conflict. Uh, he has, I think he has, visit, visit, uh, has visited most, most of the countries in Africa. And this is the last one. And he is uh, involved in a research program for the coming 20 years, for the project is financed for 20 years. In the coming 20 years, he is involved in research on uh, what will happen when congregations, female congregations, will gradually uh, disappear or will change their profile. This is for us really a, a, great, a great challenge for at the 
urges us to think out of the box, to give up the traditional five fields in theology. You know them all, you know them better than, than me, exegesis, church history, systematic the theology, moral theology, pastoral theology. These people bring in new expertises and bring in other approaches. For instance, he is a sociologist and they are really challenging us in our traditional fields of research. Then, doing research in uh, humanities is always related to a library. The library is in humanities, what the lab is in physics or in, uh, uh, in uh, engineering or whatsoever. What do we have in our library? In our library we have about 1.4 million volumes. This is the, the library of the Faculty of Theology. This is not the university library. Yeah? You have to distinguish it between. Yeah? This is the Faculty of Theology library, named after its founder, Maurice Sabe. Um, we, we have a subscription in about 1,200 journals, and we are very proud that up to this current moment, we didn't have to stop one of these subscriptions. Why are we so big? That's because of the generosity of Flanders. Uh, indeed, a good number of the books and collections we got came from the Jesuits, the Dominicans, the Oblans, the Franciscans, and so on and so forth. And for the moment, also the Holy Cross Fathers. Last week, uh, I think that I, uh, I was transferring uh, man manuscripts in Cunebula, post in Cunebula, uh, from the library of the Holy Cross Fathers to our faculty. And I think that what I had in my car was more valuable than I can ever be after 100 years of service at our university. So more than 200,000 books printed before 1800. That makes that we, that we are the biggest in the university and one of the biggest in the country, not a central library, not a royal library. But it has to do not, not only with us, of course, but it has to do with the generosity of congregations and orders in Flanders. It is, of course, a permanent concern. Uh, the budget, the yearly budget of the library is something like 350,000 euros. Some years it is a bit less, some years it is a bit more. And the university and the faculty invest in it 30%. Yeah, and all the rest, the 1st of January, we have the 30%. And at the end of the year, 31st of December, we have to cover the other 70%. And that is really a challenge because um, not only in universities, but also in the cultural atmosphere of the time, people start questioning more and more the, the importance and the value of a library. Uh, we believe that we have to continue in this way, and thus that is a great effort we have to make every year. Um, the Maurice Summer Library, our library, is also a very important because we, uh, we have, as I said, 200,000 books uh, published before 1800. So many of them must be restored. And that is for me one of the fascinating things. Uh, I'm a poor classical philologist and a church historian, but now uh, I'm talking with people who are specialists in book restoration. Other people are looking into the bindings and discover manuscripts. Amazing, we discovered part of a manuscript of the 9th century, yeah? containing, uh, um, containing a text of Augustine against the Manichaeans. 9th century, not known in the critical editions. So it's amazing. Uh, but we, ha on, we have to invest in it, but at the same time we also have to, we also have to uh, try to find money, and so now we also restore books for other institutions. One of the, the big projects we are now uh, dealing with is the restoration of the oldest codex in the Low Countries, a codex of the 8th century coming from the small city of, of small town of Mazeg. It is given to us by the major of that town and we have to restore it before 2020. 
Another project is an old Bible coming from Marissou, and we are also restoring that Bible for them. And then, of course, this is a challenge everybody is confronted with, I think, digitization. Um, here, I must, um, I must um, express a caveat, for everybody is fond of digitization, and I am a great believer in it, but I am a bit hesitant to put all the time and energy only in digitization or in digital humanities. And the reason is a bad experience we had uh, in the beginning of the third millennium. Indeed, uh, some of you probably know the Clavis of uh, Father Dickers, published already in 1961 and then reprinted several times. And in 1995-96, we were <coughs> putting it at all on, the, on disks, and when they, we then wanted to put them uh, on, uh, on a digi digital platform in 2006, we discovered that we could no longer open these disks. What was the result? Everything was sent to India, where two people uh, blind, uh, and separately, uh, separately uh, typed in the whole thing. And so we are a bit hesitant. We are not so sure that it will always work. Um, what is also important for us uh, and our library is that Leuven is very near to Brussels, or as some people say, um, Brussels belongs to the suburbs of Leuven. You can discuss it, but anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, that means that in our uh, approach, Italian, German, and French literature is very important. Thus, we try to, to, uh, to avoid a kind of anglophilia. Uh, we try to avoid that we start venerating the goddess anglophilia, and thus we also invest in Italian, German, and French literature. And uh, that is also a challenge, uh, also because many of the students coming to our faculty no longer, no longer are familiar with German. It's one of the things that really intrigues me. German is a more important language in the European community than English, and less and less people are able to read it. Last week, with one of my, my uh, postdocs, I had to go through a German text, and line by line, I had to summarize and translate it for her, because she was not able to read German anymore. Although she came from Italy, and normally in Italy you think that uh, things are going better than, for instance, in Scandinavia. Good, then uh, we try to be a global hub, uh, and like most of the hubs, you can only see half of it, yeah? Um, that means we try to develop an international network. We have journals with an international outreach, like the Revue d'Histoire Ecclesiastique, Ephemerides, Louvain Studies, and Question. Liturgique. That is a mistake. That should be an L. Yeah. Um, we also have a long tradition in organizing conferences. And uh, for us, what is very important here is a kind of freedom of research. That means that we are open to different opinions, that we stimulate discussion. We try to avoid disputes, but we stimulate discussion. And we uh, offer hospitality to all researchers, whether they're coming from um, a Protestant, an Orthodox, an Anglican, or whatever uh, background. And freedom of research is for us so important that we do think that, we do think that um, sometimes, on the basis of research, we have to conclude other things than what concrete church communities would love us to say. That is a challenge. We do that in respect. We don't try to provoke. But I think that there is a difference between an academic institution and the ecclesiastical besoignes, as they say in French. And so, to conclude, uh, we have at our faculty for the moment about 34 professors. We have a very international and engaged team. We have a very nice group of committed researchers. Uh, the professors and the researchers together, it's about 92 people. So that means that we also have to find for about 60 doctoral and postdoctoral candidates 
uh, an income for most of the doctoral candidates and postdocs. They not only work, but they also need to drink and to eat. So you need a salary for them. Then uh, the university life is characterized by competition. The time is over in every university, as far as I see, the time is over that you can continue uh, like uh, our predecessors at the end of the Middle Ages. Um, the first generation of lay researchers and collectors of money will soon retire. Uh, a German professor expects, in fact, that the university is offering him, her, all the money. A Canadian professor uh, is more willing to search for money, him, herself. The same is true for Americans who are familiar with it. But the German, up to this moment, is not so familiar with that. So, internationalization versus local embedding and writing projects versus doing research. I have a wonderful colleague in Paderborn, Hubert Dropner, who refuses to write a project. He refuses to write a project and his answer is not so stupid and has nothing to do with laziness. And I use him as an example because he has a publication list which is amazing. But he says, why the hell should I write a project if I can do the research myself. And when I do it myself, it will be better done than when I write a project and ask a young doctoral candidate. So it's a good point that he makes. Writing projects is time consuming, takes a lot of time, and at the end of the day, others are doing that what you wanted to do yourself. I think that the disadvantage of Dropner is that at the end of the day, when he leaves, nobody is waiting for a successor because there is no school. While I hope that when these, uh, when the first generation of lay researchers will leave the university, that most, if not all of them, can be replaced by young, promising scholars. So, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>